good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Food Fundamentals. This is our vegetable section, and Matt is here from Fresh Point Produce, our produce specialist that uh, is going to take us through the world of vegetables. So it should be pretty exciting. What I'd like to do is just uh, by raising your hand as we go through each list, give us the specific name of something that you know. We'll compile a list of maybe five or six things from each category that uh, we all know and love as far as these vegetables are concerned and get a, get a good idea of uh, what we know and what we don't know and start the whole thought process. What's a, what's a leafy vegetable? Somebody volunteer one. Lettuce. lettuce. What kind of lettuce? Iceberg. Iceberg lettuce. Spinach. Kale. Arugula. Okay. One more. Romaine. Okay. <coughs> That's good. Matt, how many leafy vegetables would you say there actually are that we see on a fairly regular basis? What's your estimate? Probably 60 to 70 varietals. Okay. Um, within those subcategories of lettuce, spinach, kales, arugulas, um, there are going to be subcategories within all of those and different varietals that you can break out into each of those categories. Nice. 60. Wow. Okay. Tomatoes. Cherry, Cherry tomatoes. Roma. What's another name for Roma? Plum. What did you say? Hothouse? Okay. Hothouse? Now, is that an actual variety or a it's gonna method of growing? Method of growing. Okay. Hothouse is going to be anything that's going to be grown in a greenhouse controlled environment rather than a field grown or state grown tomato, which is going to be more susceptible to. Um, bugs, weather, uh, so on and so forth. Beef steak, okay. Okay. <laughs> sun dried, that will have an asterisk as well. Is there any specific tomatoes we use for sun dried in general? Mostly you see it's going to be a smaller tomato, like a plum tomato. Plum tomato. Um, San Marzano tomato, something with a really uh, high sugar content to start with, okay. so that the finished product is going to be off the charts as far as the bricks level. A little bit less flesh inside, maybe? Mm -hmm. Okay. Very dry, not very much of a seed Good. cluster. Okay. What are some root vegetables? Carrots, did I hear? Okay. Beets? Parsnips? Okay. Parsnips, yes. Sweet potatoes would be more in the tuber family with regular potatoes. Turnip? What, what identifies or, or what defines a root vegetable, Matt? Different than a potato, um, root vegetables actually connected to the root coming out of the ground. So usually like you'll see with the tops on the carrots, um, tops on beets, where they'll have the full top still attached. Um, as opposed to a potato, where once the plant dies, um, you don't harvest any of that plant material. The potatoes are then harvested from the ground, um, pulled out of the ground, tilled up, and then sold to you that way. So anything that has the top still attached to it is more of a root vegetable. Okay. What's one more? Radish. Radish? Radish? No. Radish is not a root vegetable. Why not? Kohlrabi is not either. Root vegetables, a little bit different. Um, radishes, uh, things like these, are they're not, they're grown whole. Um, they do come out of the ground, but they're not going to be uh, the same consideration as a carrot. I don't know the exact classification as to why they're different, um, but they are different uh, subcategory from root vegetables, from what we consider as, as root vegetables. Who's got one more? Rhubarb? No. Rhubarb is not. Onions? Onions could be considered. They're, again, that's a whole other category of onions. So they're really their own separate entity um, because of how they're harvested and how they're grown. How about a rutabaga? Rutabagas? Root vegetable, yes. All right, squash or gourds. Are, these the, are squash and gourds the same thing? There's going to be hard winter squashes. There's going to be soft summer squashes, what we consider summer squashes. Okay, let's um, name a couple summer squashes. Yes, zucchini. 
What's another? No? Pumpkin is a winter squash. But let's put pumpkin on there anyway. Cucumber? No. No. Cucumbers are not in the squash family. Hold one up. What's this? Yellow squash. Yellow or a crooked neck? Two different many varietals. Crook neck, obviously, for the physical characteristic as opposed to a straight yellow squash. Also a varietal of gold bar zucchini, which is not seen grown domestically or commercially anymore. Um, zucchini of this nature only would have a bright gold color skin on the outside rather than a uh, pale yellow. Huh. Um, also baby squashes, gold patty pan squash, um, become very popular baby zucchinis. Um, also baby green patty pan squash, become very popular, nice uh, item for a plate vegetable, um, easy to prepare, very quick to, uh, to prepare and uh, put on a plate. It was a nice appearance. And the, the baby squashes I, uh, from back in my restaurant days were you know, typically with a decent-sized zucchini, you're cutting out seeds a lot of the times because they're so, you know, so full of moisture and tend to sweat down not quite as nice as the, as the uh, rind, I guess, or the meat against the rind. The baby squashes are just beautiful, cooked whole, just chopped ones, boom, you're gone. Great stuff. Okay, some winter squashes. We have pumpkin up there. What's another one? Butternut. Okay. Love me some butternut. What I'll hold up for the camera here, take a look at. This is a kabocha squash. It's known as a Japanese pumpkin. Um, very hard winter squash. Um, basically, once you harvest it in the fall, it will last you almost the whole winter. And why they were produced that way, to where they would last the winter, they have something sustainable to eat throughout the winter months. Hmm. Great soup. All right. Peppers. Is there a difference between peppers and chiles? You can have some volunteers eat a few and see if there's any difference. <laughs> <laughs> is it all heat? Uh, it is all heat. It's all based on Scoville units. Um, Scoville units have become very popular. Um, a lot of chilies have come to the market now. The habanero, as we know, was always one of the hottest. Um, people have developed peppers, a lot of which were used for military pepper sprays that are now being produced fresh. You've heard of ghost chilies. Um, ghost chilies have now come into the market mainstream into where people are eating these and using them in recipes. And uh, it's completely off the charts. It's over 100 times the Scoville scale of a habanero. So if you've ever had one of these, tasted one of these, or any hot sauce with it, you'd know how dangerous it can be. And the peppers they're creating now are even more susceptible to harm with uh, food items. So we have habaneros and we have ghost peppers. What, what are some others? Ghost chilies? Jalapeno, okay. Bell peppers. Okay. It's going to be considered a dried, dried smoked jalapeno is what a chipotle pepper is. So there's a lot of varietals, um, ancho peppers, chipotle peppers, pasillas. Um, there's a whole subsect of dried and smoked chilies that will be used, but they are all, begin as fresh peppers. What are, what are some other fresh peppers? Poblano, okay, good. It's poblano chili here. Anaheim, okay. Serrano, okay, good. All right, and last but certainly not least, and not last even, mushrooms. How many varieties of mushrooms are there? Somebody in this class knows. How many edible varieties, approximately? Anybody know? 400? Do I hear five? Do I hear 2,000? <laughs> How many about? Thousands, aren't there? There are thousands. Um, most of what you're going to see, unless you're a wild mushroom forager, uh, what you're going to see in the marketplace, what you're going to see commercially grown and used, it's going to be about 30 to 40 mushrooms um, that you're going to see on a regular basis. Uh, there are hundreds if not thousands of different mushroom varietals that are grown um, forage, some of which can kill you, some of which are edible. If you don't know the difference, that is why you'd be an expert in the field. Um, did bring some handouts for you for later on. This has a uh, mushroom guide of mushrooms that are available domestically and from Europe um, that are harvested, wildly grown, 
and would be available throughout the year. There's just a little guide to hand out later on. Cool. So how many of the, the 30 or 40 in the market, can we, can we name five of them today? Truffles? Morels? Portobello? Shiitake? These are good, huh? White, okay. I don't know if that's the official name, but that's what I've always called them. Huh? Button? White button, button mushrooms? mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Is there an official name for those? Just always known them as white domestic mushrooms. White button mushrooms, yeah. domestic mushrooms, most Shitakis. commonly known. Did we get uh, Carmini up there? Huh? Clamshell? Okay. Good. You guys are good. Well, there, there starts the whole thought process. And I think you can see this could go on and on, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go on and on here for a few minutes. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Matt and kind of let him do his thing up here. And I really want to make sure that we have a lot of interaction today. So no question should go unturned. Let's ask it if we have it. And uh, while Matt's here, we can get the right answer to these things, OK? I'll certainly try to answer all your questions if I can. If not, be sure to get back to you with as best information I can. Um, so Fresh Point, uh, I come from uh, the Fresh Point house here in Denver. Uh, we have 31 Fresh Point locations throughout the United States, uh, most of which are in key growing areas, Southern California, Arizona, um, the Northeast, uh, and also in the Southeast. Um, produce is really a seasonal thing. Um, right now, the majority of the produce you're eating that you're finding in the school, in the restaurants, in the grocery store, um, either is coming from Mexico, coming from South America, um, wherever it's warm climate. Obviously, looking outside, it's not a warm climate here right now. Um, there are still Colorado products being grown um, in hothouses, as we discussed before. Things that we source locally, um, some microgreens, some sprouts, some mushrooms, some hothouse tomatoes. Um, so there are a variety of things that are still being grown here in Colorado. Um, did bring along also a handout on a Colorado-grown product list, crop calendar, um, which I'll give to you later on if you're interested. We'll show just a guideline of what's available different months throughout the year. Um, we don't have the vast growing season that a California has or an Arizona has, a very short growing season here in Colorado. Give you an idea of what's being grown, some early fruits, some early vegetables, uh, moving on through the summer months with peppers and cucumbers and lettuces, into the fall season with peaches, pears, apples, um, from the western slope as well as some squashes and corn. Um, also a handout, um, I'm going to talk about that one later. So at Fresh Point, what we do is uh, mostly sales to restaurants, individual restaurants, hotels, catering companies, um, anything that runs the gamut of where you'd see fresh produce. Um, we do a limited amount of retail business, but most of the retail stores typically buy their own produce, bring their own produce in, market it, and sell it um, in their own environment. Um, Produce is an ever-evolving, ever-changing entity, um, really, in the marketplace. Uh, it's the one thing that is still continuing to change. Um, unlike your proteins, unlike meat and fish, they're all pretty set. Um, produce is still being crossbred, heirloom varietals, all the things that are coming to the forefront that people are requesting, people are asking for. People want variety. People want something new. People want different uh, ethnic items they've never tried before, never had before. Um, and more and more of those items are being brought into your homes, into your schools, into your markets, um, and things you didn't even know that you liked but are trying and for the first time and maybe realizing that, uh, you know, that horrible vegetable your mom forced you to eat as a kid that came out of a can or was frozen and tasted horrific, you gave it another try, like Brussels sprouts. Usually people are on the fence with Brussels sprouts. You either love them or hate them. Uh, if you go to somewhere like Steuben's and get them deep fried and uh, you've never eaten a Brussels sprout better, so... It's amazing what a little grease can do. Um, so I have just a bevy of items here in front of you as far as produce goes. Um, any questions you have on any of the items um, in front of you, let me know. Um, again, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Um, we'll talk about what we do at Fresh Point. Again, we have not only just generic produce items, potatoes, onions. Um, we also have a lot of amenity fruit items. Uh, amenity fruits. We started this program basically for our hotel customers, um, people that wanted, uh, if you've ever been in a hotel, had an amenity fruit basket, something that would be a really nice 
piece of fruit, high sugar content, something that's going to eat very well. Um, sure, thank you. Something that's going to be very seasonal. Um, right now, fresh figs are in season, apples, pears, um, a lot of citrus items you're going to see in the grocery store. This is the peak time of year, so citrus. You're going to see things like blood oranges, uh, mineola tangerines, Meyer lemons. Um, of course, cuties are these small seedless tangerines that are all the rave now that finally have come to the forefront. Easy to peel, seedless. People love them. Put them in your kid's lunch. So a lot of produce items that, again, you know, farmers are out there trying to figure out what people want to eat, what you're going to buy, what's next. You know, every chef wants to know what's next. Not only what's in season, but they want to know what's coming down the line. Um, forever it was spring mix. Uh, spring mix was all over the place. It was kind of the, the hot, kitschy item. Everyone had it on their salads. And then McDonald's started putting spring mix in their salad. So when somebody like McDonald's steps up to start selling spring mix, and all of a sudden you being a chef at a fine dining restaurant, reevaluate what you're doing, go, do I really want to sell spring mix anymore when it's become as everyday a commodity as being in a salad at McDonald's? Um, so what a lot of the companies have started to come up with are things like baby lettuces, um, baby romaine lettuce. On the list there we talked about regular romaine. Picking the crop when it's very petite, the heads are very petite and small, selling this as a quartered salad, half salad on a plate, um, selling the whole head. Red romaine lettuce, red oak lettuce, um, also green oak lettuce. So many varieties that chefs are interested in. Um, ingredients that they're using now that they've never used before in the past, wanting to have more of a global feel to their menu. Um, you know, it's a world marketplace that we live in, and so people are looking to new ingredients uh, to talk about, new ingredients to sell to their customers, things that they that might not have ever tried. Um, let's see, something I can show you here that might be, uh, say for instance, green papaya. Anybody had green papaya before? Had green papaya? Okay. And what application did you have green papaya? Uh, that's common. Okay. Everywhere, right? It's, 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 it's common. So, yes, yeah, common Thai coleslaw. Um, fabulous dish if you ever get a chance to try it. Um, you wouldn't want to eat this like you would a regular papaya. This is a Maritol or Mexican papaya. Um, smells sweet, great sugar content. This tastes nothing like that. Um, it will never ripen. It will actually rot before it ripens. Um, it's a very different animal. If you look at the outside, they look almost identical. Really no difference outside of the papaya. But until you cut it open, you realize it's a very different um, use for it, very different texture, very different flavor profile. Uh, this, they shred up in a very fine uh, portion and make it into almost like a, a coleslaw, a very spicy coleslaw. Um, very tasty dish. Whereas the... Uh, Mexican papaya, the Maridol papaya, similar to Hawaiian papayas, uh, if you've ever eaten a Mexican papaya or Hawaiian papaya, very sweet characteristic, um, but one of those fruits that you either really enjoy or don't enjoy very much. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, microgreens. Talk about microgreens. Microgreens have become all the rave here lately with chefs, um, and I'll let you pass this around and have a little sample of the microgreens. Uh, microgreens came about just as kind of a nice garnish. You know, chef always looking for garnish. Um, some chefs you'd see on your plate, you get a little sprig of parsley, you get a little sprig of something. But microgreens are the just the very tiny sprouts of a either savory vegetable or an herb, um, something that would add a lot of flavor in a very small uh, quantity. I'll go ahead and pass this around. You can have a little taste of the microgreens. What, what is that composed of for the most it's part? It's about 15 different micros in there. Oh, wow. um, so if you want to actually spread apart the greens and taste them individually on their own profile, um, in that mix there should be some uh, bull's blood, which is a micro beet green, micro arugula. Um, what else would be in there? Probably some micro um, carrot top, micro cilantro, uh, micro basil. Be a variety of different things. So really, uh, separate it out. Have a taste of each individual one. Very different flavor profile. Now, can they buy those individually as well? Like just cilantro, or they can. Wow. They can. And how do they compare price wise to like the the mature vegetable? Microgreens, on average, uh, the one thing with micros, very short shelf life. Okay. Um, not going to be. Uh, so they are, because they are so perishable. We bring them in 
couple times a week. Um, they don't last as well as they would, say, a winter squash, obviously. Um, but any leafy green is always going to be more susceptible to uh, becoming, turning faster, wilting, um, running out, because it is water-based. Um, so any time where there's water-based vegetables, it's going to lose moisture, become dehydrated a little bit faster. Uh, microgreens, prime example of that, just because they are so petite that they don't hold up that well. Um, chefs have used them frequently now, and you'll see them all over chefs' menus. Are, are they cost-wise similar? Are, I mean, you sell them by the pound or by the... They come in four and eight ounce clamshells. Okay. Um, usually run in the mid-teens for four ounces. To give you an idea, some are a little more expensive than others. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it really depends. Oh, gee. And again, s produce, going back to, you know, produce is the, it's the color on your plate, you know. It's the thing that really adds that, that pizzazz to your dish. It's going to add that, that flavor profile, mm -hmm. that uniqueness to a dish that, that most proteins will help increase the flavor profile, increase uh, you know, what you're doing with your protein. Um, produce across the board, um, just really exciting things going on with produce, the baby vegetables with um, different heirloom varietals. I brought some heirloom tomatoes today. You're finding more and more, really this started with heirloom tomatoes. Um, we all grew up, you know, as you look on the list, we talked about tomatoes. Everyone named off uh, you know, pretty generic varietals of tomatoes, cherries, romas, beefsteak tomatoes. Um, heirloom varietal tomatoes are going to be uh, something where it was a seed that has never been crossbred with any other seed varietal. It's an original varietal tomato. Uh, many of these tomatoes were seeds that were brought from people's ancestors, whether it was from Russia, from Germany, from Poland, from Italy, um, San Marzano tomatoes from Italy. Um, so many of these tomato varietals are now becoming more popular with chefs. Uh, they want a different flavor profile. They want the different color. They want the different texture of tomatoes that you're not going to find in a conventional round tomato that you're not going to find in a Roma tomato. Um, really great eating tomato um, just on their own uh, for really light summer salad, um, something to do in a, in a gazpacho or something to do in a uh, tomato water um, if you were to puree them down. Really great flavor, really great texture. It's another varietal here. So just heirloom tomato varietals alone, there's probably another 150 tomato varietals, um, just off the tip of my tongue, that you can access, resource, um, have great summer salads with. I also brought along some yellow teardrop tomatoes, pergele tomatoes. And again, these were looking, you see where the name comes from, with the pergele to where it does actually look much like the shape of a pear. Um, very small salad tomatoes, um, great sugar content, great flavor on these. And in turn, that heirloom tomato varietals has spawned more small tomato varietals, more baby tomato varietals, where people are now eating, instead of just grape tomatoes and cherry tomatoes, you're getting orange grape tomatoes, yellow grape tomatoes. Any questions so far? It is. It is. Um, you'll find a lot of that is that, you know, there's so much science in, in produce. Um, they did that with this gentleman we had from, in from the uh, Washington Apple Board. And he came in, and I asked him why red delicious apples are not so delicious. Um, and, and same type of thing. He said, we, we mess with the genetics too much. We mess with the genetics to try to get an apple that would grow quickly, would be very, you know, uniform in size. But they ended up making the skin too thick. It became very bitter. Um, it was an apple that they really they tampered too much with. And you find that with varietals of, of any produce item. Um, Mark can attest to, you know, when we grew up, you go to the grocery store, all you really had for options were iceberg lettuce, round tomatoes. Um, there, there wasn't this bevy of produce items you would see. And because most farmers wanted the best bang for their buck, uh, whatever crop was the most, uh, you know, least disease uh, or most res disease resistant, even the least amount of water could produce the most, they could get the most out of their crop. And so that's why we see so many of these other varietals becoming available now, is that people don't just want what's cheap and what's available, they want what really tastes great. And so now they're going back to and going, okay, the consumer wants great tasting produce. They don't just want cheap, readily available. 
We can all buy cheap and readily available. It doesn't matter what the commodity is. It doesn't matter if you're buying a pair of shoes, you're buying a tank of gas, you're buying anything. There's always a cheap option, middle of the road option, an expensive option. Um, and really, you're seeing that more and more in produce now. On the same subject, does that change any nutritional value at all? It really doesn't change nutritional value. Um, you know, most people have found, and I, I've got a blurb here on the uh, talk about the uh, dirty dozen, the clean 15 of produce, um, which is more of pesticides. But um, nutritional value, I mean, anytime you're eating fruits and vegetables, it's always going to be um, a bonus as far as just having fruits and vegetables in your diet. Um, nutritional value, they can tweak a little bit, um, but really it's, you're not, they're not changing the, the characteristics of the, uh, how, how healthy it is for you. It's more of just the flavor profile. Um, really when they're cross-breeding different produce items, it's going to be to create something that's um, great tasting, um, is you know, very presentable in the market, um, something that's going to give you uh, good shelf life, something that's sustainable. Um, most produce items, you know, we all buy with our eyes. And you go to the store, you scan around, we all buy with our eyes. You want to see whatever looks good. And so that's why you go to the grocery store, most backdrops in the grocery store shelf are black because everything jumps off the background uh, when it's, something is black behind it. So when you see, I mean, stores are very, you know, they're set up to attract your eye, attract your buying mind into buying things you might not normally buy, things you would be drawn to. And so produce is no different that... You know, they want something that, we talked about this varietal of, of kiwi, or not kiwi, but of uh, tangerine, of these cuties. You see them all at the grocery store now. They're everywhere. Um, quick and easy to peel. So now you see the orange market is taking a hit because most people don't buy oranges anymore. Um, these are, you know, easy to throw in your pocket, go into class, um, easy to peel, no seeds, no mess. Um, and so people, just as consumers, much easier product, more user-friendly. Um, but it's, you know, years and years of somebody behind the scenes creating this to get consumers to buy it. Um, and you see that more and more with different products as to where we'll say, okay, well, you know, most people don't like beets, you know. Beets are, don't taste very good or they look hideous. You know, you see this sitting on the shelf and, you know, you might not think, um, you know, never eat one of those, I'd never try one of those. Um, but if somebody showed you baby beets, maybe you saw them and they looked very presentable and looked um, like something you might you might buy and you might try. So, you know, people started doing baby vegetables. So baby beets, baby carrots, um, baby turnips, uh, the radishes we spoke about earlier. So many of these baby varietals um, that have come along that just uh, try to attract uh, more people into trying them. Also, more advantageous for a chef to use as a plate veg, um, to have something small that once you pare it down, peel it down, cut it down, you'll be able to serve, um, cook a little faster, faster cooking times, easier plate presentations. So a lot of, you know, again, produce is, is one of those of what are the consumers buying? What are the hot trends in produce? What are the, you know, things that people are doing? Is there a difference between uh, like crossbreeding and hybrids and genetically modified fruit? There are. Is it, well, is it a di different process or are we, are we... They're all the same. They're all the same. They're, um, you say genetically modified, though, it's... Um, I mean, it gets such a bad... Right, it does. But I think you find it more with, with large crops, things like soybeans, things like wheat, things like corn, where they use them for more than just... Um, you know, they're not using leaks anytime soon to, to power your car. They're not using it. So when you find those big sustainable crops or big uh, mass-marketed crops where you're talking about billions of tons that supply the world of food supply... Um, that's really where you see a lot of those genetically modified organisms is with things like wheat and soybeans, corn, um, the sugar levels on corn, for instance, where they want the sugar level to be so high that now they can use uh, corn-based products in just about everything you buy in the market has some corn-based derivative in it. Um, wheat, just to have a heartier crop of wheat, certain varietals of wheat that will grow faster, have a better yield, um, be more more uh, less susceptible to disease, less susceptible to drought, less susceptible to all the, the horrors that go on in the farming world, all the things that will, you know, one ravaged crop, one bad crop that will bring a farmer to his knees. Um, we found that last year in Colorado, really bad drought year, bad snow year um, for any of you skiers and snowboarders out there. Horrible, horrible snow year. And so that just trickled down right to Colorado farmers that are all fighting for water rights. Um, we sell so much of our water to Nevada, to California, 
um, that when uh, the Colorado farmers, it's their time for water, um, there's not much left to go around. So it's um, the people that get the water, depending on what crop you're using, if you're doing Rocky Ford cantaloupes, you know, you need a lot more water than somebody that's, say, growing potatoes in the San Luis Valley, or someone that's growing lettuce on the front range, um, corn in a lathe. Um, so depending on what crop you're growing, how heat resistant it is, how much water it requires, um, is, is what's going to maintain on whether or not you keep your livelihood as a farmer. Um, if you drive along the front range here, there's a lot of little farms in Boulder, outside of Boulder, a lot of little farms up in northern Colorado. Um, very small operations. You know, they're not going to be millionaires anytime soon. They rely on your dollars when you go to farmers markets in Cherry Creek, downtown. Uh, but farming is a very uh, tricky business. You know, you do want to make sure that you're getting the most bang for your buck with what you're selling. You want to make sure that what you're bringing to market, people want to buy. The farmers are very skeptical on what they're going to grow, what uh, they want people to enjoy uh, the products, but they want to make sure that you know, you're not going to be put off by how much it costs, um, the appearance of the product. Um, sometimes you know, with Colorado grown products, it's not going to be as presentable, as pretty as something you might see in a grocery store, but you're supporting the local farms. When, when, they're, when they're trying to develop, say, a, I don't know, a tomato to, to have a, uh, a longer shelf life or ripen quicker or be harder so that it trans, it's transported easier, mm -hmm. or they're trying to, to develop a, a drought-resistant vegetable um, or higher sugar content in corn or any of these things, is it, is it a natural process? Is it, is it the... the the crossbreeding of different varietals within that family to create, or is there things going on in the laboratory that we should know about synthetically? Not that I'm aware of synthetically. It's more of you're taking characteristics of stronger other varietals. We talked about tomatoes before um, and why those flavorless tomatoes. Most of those tomatoes are picked in the field before they even ripen. Um, they're barely turning pink on the vine. Um, as opposed to a full vine ripened tomato, which has all that time to. It's like taking a, picking an apple before it's ready, picking a peach before it's ready. You take a bite into it, and it's going to taste like nothing. There's no sugar, there's no flavor, there's no texture. Um, similar with tomatoes. And so a lot of these varietals that they will create to try to you know, get to market faster, um, ripen quicker. But again, you, like I was talking about with the Red Delicious Apple, is they, they do too much, too much tinkering, too much messing with the original product to keep to where the flavor profile was. And so they're finding that the backlash is people don't want to buy it as much. Um, certain individuals will, but then many other farmers come along with super sweet varietals of tomatoes or apples or um, lettuces, um, corn, different varietals. That So if you eat one varietal and you're used to and it has just a high sugar content, like a tomato, if you eat a San Marzano or you buy nice vine-ripened tomatoes in the store, you buy... Um, little cherry tomatoes like this, yellow grape tomatoes, um, and just have you know great flavor profile. Chances are you're not going to go back to the generic round, you know, small tomato and go. It's it has no value anymore to me. You know, I'm not going to buy that product. And so, the more consumers like yourself that stay away from those products, the less and less demand there's going to be for the market. And that's on the retail side. On the food service side, and what I see on a regular basis is that most. Chefs want that kind of tomato because it's cheap. You know, it's a slice on your burger. It's uh, chopped up in your salad. Something cheap and quick that they can serve to the masses. Um, so there's two different sides to the produce world. You've got the you know, supply and demand. You've got demand being food service. Um, like we talked about McDonald's before, when they bring a spring mix onto their menu. Or they bring, they started doing that uh, fruit parfait a few years ago. Well, all of a sudden, you've got that kind of demand on strawberries, on blueberries, on spring mix. You take such a massive chunk of the, the produce supply for the country and put it into this one entity on who takes the most. And really, that's where the flip side to you know wanting flavor, wanting quality, wanting great produce, flip side is we want bigger, better, faster, more. Um, and so you get that, you know, the farmer's torn between, but if, you know, Big Brother over here is giving you millions of dollars to produce bigger, better, faster, and you're buying you know, a pint of tomatoes every week, you see who's going to win. And so that's where the dilemma is with produce, um, is trying to find uh, great eating, great uh, you know, produce to the masses, but also fulfill our, our world food supply um, and what we can feed everyone with. 
Um, and that's where we're, we're torn with genetically modified is, you know, you want to have those items that will um, feed everyone, but you also want to have those items that are going to be the heirloom varietals. The, you know, you're going to pay a little more for it again, but it's going to be something very flavorful, very tasty, um, something different, unique. Yeah, it's so interesting because, like, I, I think of the Honeycrisp apple that's a hybrid, I believe, mm -hmm. and hits the market, and, oh, my God, everybody's got to get them, and they're, you know, a dollar more a pound than every other apple out there, and, you know, and they're good. Mm -hmm. And now, maybe not so good. I mean, they're starting to hit, bring some Honeycrisp to the market that I've tried that are like, wow, what happened to this apple? But now they've, um, you'll find when they grow... Well, for instance, I grew up in Connecticut. I used, grew up with Macintosh apples. Um, ate Macintosh apples all the time, Rome apples. You can't get New England Macintosh apples here in Colorado. They come from Washington State. Well, they're grown in sand in Washington State. They're growing in nice black dirt back in Connecticut. And so the, where you grow a crop is very different in what the eventual product will lend itself to. Um, soil conditions, water conditions, um, growing conditions, all those things uh, why you know, Napa Valley is renowned for its grape production. Um, same thing the western slope with our peaches and our corn. Really hot days, really cool nights, and so that's why you get that great sugar content, um, really good corn, really good peaches. So growing conditions have a ton to do with it. And so Honeycrisp apples, you might have had a Honeycrisp that was from the original area in Michigan where they bred the apple, produced the apple, and started uh, to, to make that varietal. Well, they take that Honeycrisp tree and they clone it and they put an orchard in Washington State or they put an orchard somewhere else, they grow that same apple, well, it's not the ideal growing conditions in Michigan. So you may be having an apple that is, yes, the Honeycrisp varietal, but it could be grown somewhere different. Um, one big uh, Idaho potato. So everyone knows Idaho potatoes. Idaho did a great job of marketing their potatoes. You know, I know potatoes from Idaho. What makes Idaho potatoes so special? Anybody know what makes Idaho potatoes special? Anyone? No. Just potato, right? You see it, it's like, oh, it's potato. So. The only thing special about Idaho potatoes is they have the soil that produces potatoes that have the magic combination of starch and sugar that makes very fluffy, light potatoes when you bake them, when you mash them. Um, most Colorado potatoes you eat um, have a very different composition. They're usually much more starchy than they are sugary. Um, and when that combination doesn't come together, they get very rubbery when you cook them. They don't eat very well. They don't taste at the same as eating like an Idaho potato. So you might go to the store, might have a baked potato in time, tastes great, might go back, buy some more potatoes. You're thinking, good to go. And so you have that same experience twice, and the second time you get this very mealy, weird potato. It doesn't taste very good. Um, we've all had, you know, my great story is peaches. When I go to the store, I always eat stuff. You know, I'll be in there just grazing. Because I hate nothing worse than buying some peaches, buying some fruit, buying whatever, a watermelon. You bring it home, take a bite, and it's just the most horrific thing you've ever put in your mouth. You know, it looks great, smelled great, was ripe, and it's just this mealy, disgusting mess. And so you never know what you're going to buy until you actually bite into it. And so it's always good as a consumer, and usually, you know, people might look at you a little weird, but at least you're getting what you pay for. Um, a lot of times you'll see in these stores, you know, they'll have these great deals on, you know, on fruit. Buy, you know, 10 for a dollar, or, you know, buy 10 pounds for a buck, whatever it is. And, you know, it's, again, goes back to the you get what you pay for. You know, you can buy something very nice, that's going to taste great, you might pay a little more for it, like the Honeycrisp apple, or get a deal on something, you bring it home and say it's a grapefruit or an orange and it just tastes bland, tastes like nothing, you know, just tastes like water. Um, and that's really what you need to uh, be aware of with produce is, is, you know, take the time to look at some different things, try things in the store, ask the produce guy, hey, what's, what's tasting great, what's looking good? Um, chefs ask me all the time, you know, what's What's in season? What's great right now? I don't want, you know, don't give me what's expensive. Give me what's great. Um, and great doesn't always have to correlate to price. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Any questions? Do you ever hear those apples that are sweet? The hidden rose apple. We do. We do. We've gotten the hidden rose apple. There's more and more heirloom varietal apples now. Uh, we talked about apples. You know, we listed off the five or ten back there, but there are hundreds of apples that were uh, existing original varietal apples. Um, some that are great for baking, some that are great for canning, um, or turning into applesauce, some that are great for pie apples. Um, so there again, what's your end application? You know, if you're making something, you're making a dish, and you want to know what's, you know, when you go to the store, you see 20 different potatoes. So what's a good potato for if I'm making 
a soup. I'm making potato soup. I'm making au gratin potatoes. I'm making uh, my own homemade fries. Whatever the application is, always ask or do some research first on what you're buying, what you're getting into. Because everything does cook differently, taste differently, have a different application. Um, on the line here, we'll just show you a few things. For instance, kale. Kale's become all the rage lately with kale salads. Um, kale, some of you may see this driving around Denver. A lot of people plant it this time of year. Um, grows really well in the winter. It's ornamental kale. Used done a lot, I'm sure, salad bars. Back in the day, you've seen it on a million different salad bars. People use it as garnish. Um, but now kale, like this lacinato kale, it's Tuscan kale, um, has become really popular. Um, for people cooking, eating kale on a more regular basis, different than a curly kale um, for greens, for winter greens, hearty winter greens. The different things, in lacinato kale, this just came along probably here within the last five or six years, started being sold commercially. It was always around, was an Italian varietal kale, um, but really nobody used it in the States. Nobody, people knew this kale, but it was very boring. People knew this kale, it was mostly garnish. Um, and it was one of those vegetables that was just kind of forgotten. Um, same thing with greens now. Uh, I've seen is, is that something that's uh, more edible raw, or does it need to be cooked more like the curly A little bit kale? of both. Uh -huh. You'll see, you know, a very, um, uh, very tight, like if you were to finad the kale and be able to do a, a kale salad with it, um, served raw. Um, True Food Kitchen in Cherry Creek, they do a, uh, every dish you get there comes with their side of kale, and it's just kind of a... Uh, roasted kale um, in the oven or a baked kale um, served just you know very simply dressed and is, is really nice great flavor great vitamin uh, structure in it um, really tasty product as opposed to again maybe one of those vegetables you had as a kid your mom forced you to eat and you just completely hated it and haven't gone back to since um, let's see over here I've got some collard greens uh, greens are big right now as well. Big winter veg. Um, you see a lot of mustard greens, collard greens, braising greens, um, spinach as we talked about earlier. Most times you see baby spinach in salads. So many different varietals of spinach though. Bloomsdale spinach, heirloom varietal spinach, purple spinach. Um, some use more raw in salads. Some use more for cooking applications, things to braise down, using soups, using salads. Brought some fennel bulbs along. Um, we've also gotten into baby fennel now, um, micro fennel. I didn't bring any micro vegetables in. I didn't bring some micro cucumbers, which I'll share with you here. I'll pass those around. So in addition to the micro greens, we're getting into micro vegetables now. Uh, micro vegetables, just tall, small, small, tiny, petite. I mean, carrots that are the size of, you know, no more than an inch, inch and a half in length. Fennel bulbs that are the size of your pinky thumbnail um, to where, you know, Chefs kind of want what's next, and so people are creating what's next and just creating very small varietals of vegetables um, to where it has a different flavor profile. You can eat it raw, consume it raw. I'm up front here, I have some candy stripe beets, um, chayoga beets, also known as chayoga beets. Um, taste similar to regular red beets or gold beets, a little sweeter, a little more sugar content. Can you show those under the camera? Mm -hmm. I keep forgetting about the camera. Candy striped beets, and in the back here is a uh, watermelon radish. Um, green on the outside, and has that watermelon appearance or the rind appearance with a pink heart. Um, eats like any other radish, though, has that same, you know, very spicy bite to it. So more for appeal. I've seen chefs do like a very thin, paper-thin slice, almost serve it like a radish carpaccio. Really nice presentation. A couple other different radishes we have up here. I did bring along some daikon radish. Uh, you may have had daikon sprout before, which um, comes from the same plant. Um, the sprout is a very spicy sprout, similar flavor profile to the radish. Um, this is what the daikon radish actually looks like in the whole, and again, can be served a num number of different ways, mostly served raw. Some of the other radishes on the side here, these are uh, breakfast radish. In my right hand, and then Easter egg radish here in my left hand. Do you know what the, the main nutritional value of, of radishes are? I mean, I don't know a whole lot of people that eat radishes. No, it, it is one of those vegetables people either love or hate. Um, I think a lot of vitamin A, I believe, in radishes. Um, but, you know, mostly uh, high water content, 
Um, it's more for the spicy bite to the radish, you know, as far as nutritional value. I'm not sure um, what else. Oh, let's see. Any questions? Uh, I've been reading about hydroponic gardening and the, uh, on an industrial scale. Do you guys mm -hmm. deal with that at all? We do. Any, any of your suppliers? Quite Are a they, bit. Um, hydroponic gardening, uh, you'll find a lot with um, peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes, um, also with some microgreens. Uh, most of our microgreens that we get in are going to be uh, grown in soil. They tend to hold up a little longer, the most hydroponic veg. Um, Flavor-wise, a little bit different, um, but most hothouse operations, uh, again, it's going to be very limited loss as far as crop is concerned because it's a controlled environment. You control the heat, you control the humidity, you control the temperature, um, you control the uh, light. Um, so everything involved with, so you get very good returns as far as vegetables. Um, where, give you an example. Where's the nutrients for the plants coming from? Are they in, is it mixed in with the water that they're growing in? It or? is mixed in with the water. Um, typically the root system hangs down through a hollow tube. Um, the hydroponic system will turn on every 15 to 20 minutes to hydrate the root. Um, they'll add any nutrients that are needed to the water supply. So as it's coming through, they'll get their blast of, of hydration as well as minerals and vitamins and whatever other nutrients they need to let the plant survive. Um, there's an idea of some hothouse farming here. The red pepper on my, my right hand is a conventionally grown pepper, field grown pepper. Uh, the one in my left hand is one that is hothouse grown. You can see the consistency. It's also known as like a red holland bell pepper. Um, very consistent in shape and size, uniformity, um, as opposed to this pepper, which has much different structure. Um, again, this pepper, the red holland bell in my left hand, is going to be a lot more expensive than one you'd see in a uh, field grown or conventional grown. Um, much less susceptible to disease, much less susceptible to any uh, blemishes, any skin blemishes on those. Um, we did talk about um, number one, number two produce. You'll see uh, a lot of times you go into the store and you'll see items that are less expensive. Um, there are different tiers of produce we talked about number one grade and number two grade. Um, to give you an example, let's see here. Uh, we'll go with the zucchini and yellow squash here. We'll just do zucchini. So again, different grades of zucchini here. One in the middle, the baby zucchini. It's going to be very expensive. We sell a five pound box of baby zucchini for around $40. Um, from just five pounds. Again, it's going to be about 100% yield, uh, very, you know, petite veg. Next step up from that is going to be, uh, this is what would be called a, uh, it's the medium zucchini. Um, mm -hmm. Not going to be a fancy grade or an extra fancy grade. And you can see there's some deformity in shape and size. There's some scarring externally on the vegetable. Um, so again, it's not going to be, uh, the FDA does their grading scale. They decide what's a number one grade, what's a number two grade and then you go to market with it from there so that you get more money for a better looking product, a better graded product, than you would for a less grade product. Produce works a little bit differently. When the market condition is the worst, the price is the highest. When the market condition is the best, the price is the lowest. Um, again, supply and demand. So when just a month ago, a month or so ago here, we had a big freeze down in Mexico, down in Arizona, some of the key growing regions. Um, really threw things into turmoil with produce. Um, lettuce markets went through the roof. Cases of lettuce that would normally be $18 to $20 were double that price, $40 for basic romaine, basic, uh, you know, iceberg lettuce. So a lot of times you saw when you went to the grocery store, either one, they wouldn't stock it, um, or you'd see the price substantially different. Sometimes you notice, sometimes you don't. If it's an item you buy all the time, you might notice a big price spike. Um, you'll see it with um, bananas. You'll see it with citrus. You see it with avocados is a big one. You know, sometimes you go in for avocados, it's three for a buck. Sometimes you go in and they're a buck fifty a piece, and you're going, well, what? You know, what happened with avocados? So, a lot of that is just supply and demand of when you know avocados in their peak season, and you can get them very cheap. Um, take advantage of it because uh, there are times where you won't be able to. Um, so you'll see the zucchini here. The one uh, next to it is a, a fancy grade zucchini. Again, very uniform in shape and size. Hardly any scarring externally. Um, but if you look in the store, 
you know, so a case of this medium zucchini, probably $18 to $20. A case of this extra fancy zucchini, probably another four to six bucks a case. Um, so depending on the application, you know, if you're chopping it up making soup as opposed to you want to serve it as a nice, um, you know, cut veg or something where you need a baton or a certain uh, cut and you want it to just be uniform and very nice. Um, so again, we get all different types of chefs, all different type of needs and, and, uh, and uh, resources. Um, speaking of avocados, um, talking about produce, we talked about peaches. We go to the store, you get a peach, you eat it, it tastes horrible. Same with avocados. Um, most avocados, go ahead. It's just in the growing process, just strictly in the growing process. Um, if you've ever <coughs> you seen the grocery store, you know, again, we all buy with our eyes. When you go in and you look, whether it's um, you're buying apples, you're buying a melon, whatever it is you're buying, you're always going to kind of, you know, look over, okay, this one's kind of scarred, this one's a little beat up, this one looks, you know, has more green than red on it, I'm not going to buy this. And so very similar ideas that, you know, when the FDA comes in and they grade produce, um, whether it's citrus, whether any, any commodity, they come in and they determine if it's number one or number two grade. Same field, same crop, same tree, doesn't matter. It's just everything produces number one quality product and number two quality product. And it's more of just a field decision from there on what gets put in what box. Um, so it's really when it's harvested, there's some decisions made at that point in time that this tomato is grade A or grade right. one. Is, is it A or one? Um, mostly it's a, it, it's, it goes in grading scale, right? It'll be like, this is a grade A, this is grade B, grade C. Um, you see it with apples all the time. You know, you see those bagged apples that are about the size of your fist, you know, in a bag. Um, and then you see apples that are, you know, three times that size mm -hmm. in the store. You're going to pay a lot more money if you see an apple tree. Super large apples aren't going to produce as many on a tree as our small apples. So again, supply and demand, you're going to pay three times the amount for that large apple as you are for a bag of apples because the tree is just going to produce more small fruit. Um, with avocados, the big thing with avocados, um, always look uh, on the, usually on the sticker on avocados, you'll see if it's from Mexico, if it's from California. Um, we'll typically have a much higher oil content. Um, we'll eat a lot creamier texture. Um, we'll make better guacamole. We'll just have a much better flavor to it. won't be as fibrous. Which um, one? If you see avocados that are from Chile, that are from Peru, um, they're usually going to be much cheaper than Mexican and California avocados. But they're going to be very fibrous. They're very watery. Uh, when you go home and you try to eat them, very different flavor profile. You'd be very disappointed with them when you get them home. Um, similar to, go ahead. They're really available year-round. There is no off-season for them. Right now, the majority of the crops coming out of Mexico, um, but there is offshore fruit coming from uh, Chile and Peru. Um, so again, you'll have to look at what you see in the grocery store. Always, so always see the little produce sticker. Always look at the produce sticker. We'll tell you where things are coming from. Um, a good idea if you just want to shop wisely as far as, you know, try to lessen your, your imprint on where you're buying things from. If you don't want to buy grapes that are from Chile right now and you want to wait until grapes start from California again, if you want to know if you're getting good produce, um, a lot of times that sticker is going to tell you a lot of information on where things are coming from. Um, avocados are a big one because they just do such a different experience. They are cheap, and so a lot of people buy them, import them into this market, because, again, supply and demand, they're a cheap commodity. So maybe you're whatever restaurant and you use a ton of avocados, but you don't really care about flavor profile. You're just you know, making guacamole, doing whatever. It is. Try to supply those demands as opposed to somebody who wants a really nice eating avocado, um, a restaurant like Lola or Tamayo that's doing tableside guac. They want their avocados to just be stellar, first rate, you know, great flavor profile, um, nice creamy texture, great oil content to them. more is that you know we're all so concerned about our our environmental footprint right now and when we're buying produce from Chile which is you know thousands of miles away as compared to California it, it costs us more environmentally than perhaps we realize as far as what we're paying at the store for it right. because it's a major major deal to get fruit up from that far into the into the United States and distributed right a lot of trucks, boats. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Planes, trains. And it does. It, um, you know, we all ideally 
some chefs in town talk about you know eating seasonally. Well, really, if you were eating seasonally, you'd have a pretty boring diet right now. You'd be eating things like this kabocha squash. You'd be eating things like leeks. Um, you'd be eating things like onions and potatoes. Um, there really wouldn't be a whole lot available as far as uh, what would be in season right now in the winter months um, and why people became so obsessed with canning and storing and any type of way to preserve ingredients um, that weren't available year-round. And really where all the you know, canned vegetable comes from before frozen, it was canning, it was jarring, it was anything to pickling, anything to preserve product so it would be available year-round. So you could enjoy those peaches in the dead of winter. You could enjoy apples in the dead of winter, things that weren't normally available to you. Um, and so now, because we live in a global marketplace that we've become very spoiled with, well, I'll just go to the store and get strawberries in February. I'll just go to the store and get, you name the commodity. You know, you can go and get watermelon now. But you take it home, and then you wonder why it doesn't taste so great. Again, it's coming from somewhere halfway around the world, uh, maybe not grown in great uh, soil or great conditions to where it's not going to be that watermelon you had at a barbecue this summer that just, you know, knocked your socks off. So very different flavor profile, excuse me, very different flavor profile, very different experience eating something in season versus eating something out of season. Go ahead. From Chile? Um, Right, right. They do. The Chilean grapes are, are amazing. Um, we get a lot of Chilean grapes in this type of year. All, all your table grapes you're going to see in the market, um, green, red, black table grapes. Um, they do some other varietals, the Muscat and Concord, um, Champagne grapes. So right now it's their fall where it's our winter and then they'll turn into. So you're also seeing some of their stone fruit as well in the store now. You'll see peaches and plums and nectarines and wonder where it's from. And all that is from Chile as well. Um, their stone fruit's gotten a ton better here in the past 10 years. Uh, it used to be very mealy, used to be very kind of just suspect at best. Um, and you see it in the stores. And, and still I'd be leery if you're going to go and buy it. Definitely try some in the store. Try it out, see how it is before you buy 10 pounds of it and take it home. Um, most everything else, most of our real crop vegetables are what we call just basic dry veg right now. Um, Mexico is huge for that right now. Arizona, I mean, you're going to areas in the desert. Um, asparagus right now we get out of uh, South America, mostly out of Peru. Um, we went in probably 10 years ago into Chile and Peru and some areas in the United States and tried to uh, get them to slow down with all the things of uh, coca production. Um, and said, let's give you another sustainable crop that you could bring into the United States that doesn't cause drug wars and other things. And they said, introduce asparagus. Happened to be a great growing area for asparagus. And so now we import boatloads of asparagus, um, thousands and thousands of tons a year that come into the California marketplace. Um, everything from pencil asparagus, white asparagus, jumbo asparagus, purple asparagus. Um, everything that comes in on boats almost every day into the port. Um, so a lot of things that we've gone to different countries and uh, things that we can't produce here during the winter months and wanted other countries to help us support this global food supply, um, to be able to come in and give them a, a crop to be able to provide jobs, provide an income, export, um, things to be able to, uh, that we would buy and have commodities for. And so we've created a lot of those um, entities and partnerships um, with global trade on just and vice versa they look to us to provide them with certain things whether it's wheat soy corn crops things that we know across the plains that we provide and produce millions of tons of every year that we can go out and sell in the global marketplace uh, let's see any questions um, I'll hand around talk about the Dirty dozen and clean fifteen. It's just how they're grown. Just how they're grown. Um, asparagus grows uh, really, really quickly, and uh, so a spear of asparagus. Um, some spears grow thinner. Some spears grow thicker, and they have a grading scale on how they produce them, similar to. We talked about sizing on, on any vegetable or any fruit, um, how things would be graded. So pencil asparagus is going to be just that, the size of a pencil, as opposed to jumbo asparagus, which is going to be 
sometimes you know close to the size of this of this leak, um, very large in diameter. Um, typically, the pencil asparagus is going to be much more tender. Uh, the skin won't be as rough, won't be as fibrous. Where the jumbo asparagus, typically you have to peel the skin on the outside, um, take a little longer to cook. Um, just depends on the application and how what people want to use for it. Or use it for. Um, on the front side of the handout um, is our chef's toy box. Our chef's toy box is just uh, really seasonal items that we have um, in-house right now. It'll be things that we go into a restaurant with and just say, chefs, hey, what's, what's available right now? What's really great? What's in the marketplace that I should be buying, that I should be using in my restaurant? Um, so we created this chef's toy box to give them an idea, a snapshot of what's in the marketplace, kind of 10 or 15 really fun items to be using um, in the restaurants and to have things that are seasonal, things that are readily available, um, some fun items, uh, microgreens, that type of thing. On the back side of this is a, uh, something I had printed off. It's a dirty dozen and clean 15 of produce. A lot of talk these days about organic produce, reasons why you should buy organic, um, which is great. Here's a good snapshot into, uh, it's called the dirty dozen of the 12 items that are found to have the most pesticides in them when they've been tested, the most chemicals and most pesticides that they contain when they test the vegetables. Um, on the bottom, the clean 15 are the ones that are the safest to eat. They don't recommend you buy organic and ones that you can um, consume and not have as much, uh, as much issue or uh, problem with um, consuming and getting those same chemicals and pesticides. Um, so talk about organic for a second. Anybody here buy organic produce religiously? Like to buy organic produce religiously? Fine, so it's, organic is um, becoming more and more popular in the marketplace. Um, demand for it is greater. But you'll also see that this time of year there becomes a much higher price on a lot of organic produce. Um, most of the reason is that there's just not as much produced. And so when the market share has been shifting year by year with more <coughs> organic produce grown, more fields dedicated to organic produce, switching the soil over to organic to even begin to produce organic items, um, but that takes time. And so you're seeing more and more of that, and the more consumers that buy organic produce consistently, you'll see those prices come down further and further. Um, it's practical for most people to buy it if you're uh, buying an abundance of produce or buying for you know, a small family. Um, for a larger family, it might not be as practical. Some people are more adamant about it. Others are not. Um, it really depends on kind of your prerogative and if you think it's important in buying any organic item. Um, they just put out a study here recently about nutritional value with organic versus conventional. And really there's no difference um, with nutritional value, um, but again it comes down to pesticides and what is in the soil, what's in the water, um, what you're putting into your body end of the day. Um, so look over the list. Questions? Um, it can be, yes, it can. Repeat the question. She asked the question was um, hot house items and uh, things that are grown in a uh, hydroponic environment, can they be considered organic? They can be considered organic. Um, a lot of our microgreens um, are organic. Um, a lot of things, there are organic hot house tomatoes, um, hot house cucumbers, they are available. They can do it to where you're using uh, natural items in the process to where you're not using any chemical uh, nutrients, any chemicals at all introduced into the whole process um, to where they can be considered organic. Um, they have varying degrees, you know, I mean, it would be a lengthy list if they went into all produce items. Bananas. Bananas, I think they do recommend, um, from what I've read, that they do recommend. What was the second item? Uh, oranges. oranges. I'm not sure about citrus. I don't think as much because there is, um, again, that barrier, and that protection. Uh, if you go on the ones that uh, most of the items you'll see on that second category, things like onions, avocados, um, kiwi fruit, cabbage, eggplant, things that have an exterior skin, something that'll 
help prevent them from pesticides, because most of the time they're sprayed pesticides. So usually you're not going to eat the skin of a cantaloupe or a watermelon. Same thing with an orange, same thing with a banana. You're not eating the skin. Um, so something where really the produce internally is protected from any pesticides that might be um, sprayed on a crop or sprayed externally. Things that have kind of a protective shell. Go ahead. Okay. Any questions on Dirty Dozen, Clean 15? Really great restaurant in Cherry Creek, uh, True Food Kitchen. This is basically the principle and their footprint for their whole um, program, their whole restaurant, their whole program. Um, in addition to um, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory ingredients, um, really all the produce they buy from us uh, centers around this philosophy of the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. I mean, items they buy organic, sell organic. Um, great restaurant, great food, really simple approach, um, but just really healthy ingredients. Your simple applications. Food? Yeah, come up. Anything you'd like to try? Um, please come up and uh, get a sample. This looks like a uh, <laughs> similar to caviar. So again, all eggplant pretty much tastes the same. You know, these here are Chinese eggplant. Um, different than Japanese eggplant, are usually smaller and more dark purple. Um, Thai eggplant, very dense seed cluster inside. So not much flesh as opposed to an um, Italian eggplant, which won't have as much seed cluster, will have more flesh than seed pocket. Pretty cool stuff so far. People want all organic, they want no pesticides, they want everything, but also you have usually much uglier produce because no pesticides means more bugs, means more holes in your lettuce, more chewed on items, and so pros and cons. Again, it's going to be more cost, a little bit uglier produce, healthier, in the long run, yes, you're going to pay more for it. Can you afford to pay more for it? Some people can, some people can't. Um, you know, usually, you know, they put Whole Foods in neighborhoods as they do for a reason, usually because they're more affluent areas that have the money to go to some place like Whole Foods and, and buy those ingredients, and buy really high-end ingredients, nice ingredients. Um, when you go in there, though, and the reality of what they sell is that um, you can go to a Sprouts market or you wonder why, well, okay, the same ingredient I'm buying in a Sprouts or Vitamin Cause, you get a much better deal on it. So again, they have the namesake. They know they can get a little more for it because they're in Cherry Creek or they're in the Highlands or they're wherever their store is located. So, Again, marketing has a lot to do with it. As they go, okay, well, we're Whole Foods, so we're going to charge whatever we want. Um, you know, I sell a pound of chanterelle mushrooms this time of year, $15, $18 a pound, any chef on the street. You go into Whole Foods, say that same pound of chanterelle mushrooms, they're trying to get $38 to $40 a pound for. $49.99. Yeah, so it's, it's just ridiculous. And they get, you know, the housewife has been home watching the Food Network, wants to make some cool dinner for her husband and go buy some <laughs> chanterelle mushrooms because she read about it or she saw about it on Food Network. So... Our, our mindset has just changed completely with, you know, everybody, good and bad. Everyone is more aware of what's going on with produce. We're more aware of where our food comes from, um, whether it's meat, whether it's fish, whether it's produce, um, what's sustainable, what's organic. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, there's a lot of information you need to look into. Make smart decisions. Make wise decisions with what you buy. Support your local farmers, please. It means a lot to them means a lot to the Colorado um, environment um, and just will only get better. More farm to table, um, more great farms. Um, just as a whole, we'll really uh, support the Colorado uh, economy. But uh, it's funny, you go to some of these farmer market early in the season and you see produce and uh, you know, they've got peaches out and they're selling them as Colorado peaches. And you know they haven't harvested a single Colorado peach yet. They're all coming from California and they're selling them as Colorado products. So, Buyer beware with what you get. A lot of times you'll get duped at some of these markets and you'll go and people are trying to sell you something. So talk to the farmers. They'll give you the information. They'll tell you what their farm is, what they grow, who they are, and you can tell who's who and who's trying to just make a buck as opposed to the people that are truly supporting Colorado agriculture. Um, it's been a lot of issues lately with food safety. Um, it's been a huge, huge issue since two years ago, Jensen Farms, um, which was nowhere near Rocky Ford, but was selling Rocky Ford cantaloupes and that varietal. Um, so again, marketing and branding, you know, people just knew the Rocky Ford name. Well, Jensen Farms was nowhere near Rocky Ford, but they sold Rocky Ford cantaloupes. Sold them to all these grocery chains, coast to coast, 
13, 15 people died. I forget the exact number, but horrific, horrific tragedy. Um, so for the rest of the summer, nobody wanted to touch cantaloupe. It doesn't matter if it was from California. It didn't matter if it was from Colorado. Nobody wanted to buy California or cantaloupe. You'd see signs in the grocery store that said, these are not Rocky Ford cantaloupes. These are from California. Um, so the cantaloupe market took a huge hit just from that one outbreak. Um, seen more and more food safety issues. We've had it with green onions. We had it a few years ago with spinach. We've had it um, more recently with spinach again. Um, a lot of these items, that it's just the, the cost of doing business. Uh, everything can't be 100% safe all the time. The practices are a thousand times better than they ever were um, with food safety just because of all the liability uh, with food, um, with eating raw produce, not washing things, not cooking things where most of these things would, would be killed off, whether it listeria, E. coli, or other bacteria that would make you ill. So really in Colorado, um, our suppliers came back to us and we had to go to them and say, we need food safety uh, requirements from you. Um, HACCP, AIB certifications, gap audits, showing that you have a cold supply chain, um, showing that you do field audits, you test for these things, you test for um, groundwater, you test for all these different samples that may infect your product. Um, and there was a lot of vendors that we had in a lot of farms we couldn't do business with anymore. Um, a lot of the smaller farmers uh, can't pay to get those type of things done. They can't provide those type of services. But we as a company had to make a decision that, you know, if we, God forbid, killed somebody from tainted produce or made somebody sick or had some type of outbreak, that were held liable. Um, most small farmers, if you know, they came to a lawsuit, like Jensen Farms, they had to file bankruptcy um, due to the fact that they couldn't pay any of the bills. You know, they couldn't, uh, when all the lawsuits came down and all the, all the issues started to hit, that uh, they weren't able to be a farm anymore, weren't able to sustain uh, the pressure. Um, and that's gonna happen more and more is that these small local farms um, are gonna be under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of pressure to provide safe products safe produce into the marketplace. So things you buy, just be weary of where it comes from. You see a lot of these farms on the side of the road. Usually there's not, not far from a, you know, some cattle, some pigs, some type of other grazing animal that could be nearby, um, things that'll taint the water supply. The one that was a few years ago, uh, Earthbound Farms, is one of the most popular organic labels around. Um, they had a spinach crop that was irrigated with water that was tainted from a nearby cattle farm completely oblivious to it. And they were watering the crops, going about their daily business, sending out the spinach, not realizing it was tainted with E. coli. Uh, we had pallets, probably six pallets of product we had to destroy. And that was just our one facility. So not only was it all the spinach products that we had gotten, nobody wanted to buy spinach, there was spinach in spring mix. Um, so all these things that it didn't matter where the spinach was, everything had to be pulled aside, destroyed, um, accounted for, trace back to. So now you're seeing that there's more and more food safety issues where people want traceability on what comes into the door, what comes into their restaurant. Um, so if there is a foodborne illness, some type of issue that it's traceable all the way back to the farm. Um, we spend countless hours doing that, everything that comes in labeled, tracking, uh, making sure that everything's uh, scrutinized and we get audited probably 10 to 15 times a year. Um, blind audits where they'll come in, check our facility, check our records, check our documentation to make sure we're following cold chains, um, all of our uh, preferred work methods on what we're doing to make sure uh, there's food safety. Uh, cold chain's a big one. Uh, anytime produce goes below a certain level, depending on what the ideal storage temperature is, you're going to have more bacteria growth. You're going to have more room for issues, problems that may, uh, may occur. Um, dirtier products, you know, always be aware of things like potatoes, things that are coming directly out of the ground. Um, you know, whatever was in the soil is going to be on the item. So take the extra time to scrub items that come out of the ground, peel the items, uh, make sure they're <coughs> clean. There's plenty of great produce washes you can buy in the grocery stores, um, things you can rinse produce with. Uh, get off some of the food grade wax, um, which is a big one for shipping product. You'll see it on peppers, give it that nice glossy appeal, but also um, prevents it from decaying. As rapidly. Can you explain? Uh, maybe I didn't hear you right, but the, you, did you say that there are certain temperatures that if you are too low, it causes issues? It, it, it will. The biggest thing is going to be shelf life. Um, shelf life on product. We've had trucks come in where 
truck comes from California, it's three days out to get to Colorado. Um, if the truck's not traveling at the right temperature, um, we'll decrease the amount of uh, shelf life that product has. Um, whatever's in the product um, can grow more bacteria. If there's bacteria on the product, be more susceptible to items. Um, any issues that are attached to the produce at the time when it's shipping. Um, is, it's is, be, that, uh, is there an ideal temperature? Uh, I mean, I would assume there's a strata for all sorts of different products. There is. Tomatoes like it this way, peppers like it this way. We have four different coolers in our warehouse um, that are all different temperatures. Leaf items uh, are different than, uh, we'll separate out peppers and citrus items, cucumbers sit in one cooler. The other cooler is tomatoes, potatoes, onions prefer a different, or are ideal at a different temperature. Um, cold items like leaf items, um, iced items like broccoli, broccolini, uh, very cold temperature, artichokes considered very cold temperature, Brussels sprouts. Um, items that will come packed in ice, uh, travel well as ice products. Um, dry veg, ideal storage temperatures, um, going to be more similar to a potato, you know, warmer climate, warmer temperature. Is there a, um, something you could possibly share with us that has that kind of, that spectrum? Maybe not with you, but you could get to me at some point? This list here, and I'll hand out, this is a nice glossy two-sided. Jimmy grabs them as well to put on your um, coolers. I have ideal storage temperatures cool. um, for different items. It has on here not only ideal storage temperatures, any walk-in you go into, typically you're going to have it arranged to uh, where you store your dairy, where you store your meat, your fish, your produce. And you can find out what those temperatures are from setting thermometers throughout. Typically, upper back corners of a cooler or a walk-in are going to be the coldest spots. Items closer to the door are going to be a little more warm. Um, and where you place your items will depend on fresh herbs versus your iced items versus your leafy items. Um, so you can pass these out. And also has items that continue to ripen. And then other items to leave out of the cold room. Things you never want to store cold. Things like avocados, bananas, citrus, grapefruit, limes, mangoes, um, winter squashes, potatoes, tomatoes, watermelons. Things you wouldn't want to leave in a very cold environment. Um, much longer list of items that you would want to leave in that 32 to 40 degree range. And then the middle of the road is 40 to 50 degree temperatures. Um, ripening items, things that ripen after harvest, as opposed to fruits that don't ripen after harvest. Um, so things like bananas, avocados, um, stone fruits, peaches, apricots, nectarines, plums, that will continue to ripen. Um, papayas, mangoes, tomatoes, as opposed to items where once they're harvested, they won't continue to ripen. They'll decay, continue to rot before they ripen. A um, good example of that is apple and pear crop. We only have one harvest a year of apples and pears in Washington State, but we get apples and pears throughout the year. Um, so ideal time to eat apples and pears in the fall into the winter months you start getting into the spring, you'll see some offshore fruit come out of New Zealand, out of Australia, and their apple and pear crop. And then really, towards the end of that, you don't want to be eating apples and pears. Wait for that next fall crop to come around. They have special chambers they keep apples and pears in that have a very low um, oxygen level to them, and they're very, very cold. Um, we keep apples and pears in our coldest environment. It slows down the rep respiration rate of the fruit to keep it from decaying, keep it from turning brown, discoloration, um, any type of bruising on the fruit. Um, stored for apples and pears, so they have them to sell and market throughout the year. So food storage is the big one uh, with produce items, obviously more so with meat and fish, but produce equally as much. Um, selling good quality produce, getting the most value for your money, not having shrink, not throwing product in the trash. Um, we deal a lot with, I talked about number one, number two produce before have a hard time. Some chefs understand it, some chefs don't. You get what you pay for. Sometimes if you're buying a number two product, you might use 60-70% of the case, the other 30-40% goes in the trash. Whereas if you're buying a number one product, something's a good quality product, you're probably going to use 90-100% to yield on a case. Um, it goes back to what you paid for. So again, people think they're getting a great deal. We've all done it. It doesn't matter the item, whether it was a cheap DVD player, whether it was 
you, know, you name it, a car. I mean, we've, all, we've all made the mistake of, oh, look at how cheap this is. And you get it home, and it lasts a month, lasts a couple years, and then you're back to buying the same item again. So produce is really no different. Um, you, know, you get what you pay for. Some people think they're getting a good deal. Get it home, you get that mealy peach, you get that really fibrous, tasteless avocado, tomatoes that taste like the box they came in. Um, it doesn't matter the item, it just uh, comes down to, you know, if it's cheap, it's usually cheap for a reason. Um, sometimes people just buy along. A lot of times grocery stores will run ads. You know, they'll have ad items like, we're going to feature strawberries right now. We've got a great buy in strawberries out of California. When you go into the store, you see berries. You see blueberries or blackberries, and they're, you know, a buck a pint, where usually they're 4 to $5 a pint. Um, so great smoking deal on berries and to where somebody like a King Supers or a Safeway, they can go out as the, the massive company that they are and uh, buy truckloads of berries to be able to sell to all their stores and give you a really great price on them. You'll see that a lot at a Sunflower Market will do that. Um, buy things in bulk, mass quantities, be able to sell it to you very cheap. Retail is a much different market than food service. Um, in my world that I live in, um, we don't buy on retail is very high volume, low margin, as opposed to we buy lower volume but higher margin. We're selling direct to restaurants, hotels, catering companies, that kind of thing. Um, because they're not buying the volume. They're not buying pallet quantities of thing. They're buying a five pound box. They're buying a case. They're buying a pound of fresh herbs. It's a little different animal, a little different ideas, um, very similar uh, with what the products are. You're seeing more and more in the retail aspect, um, certain markets that you go to, some really great ethnic markets in town that you can go to and buy some really unique items. Some of the things you've seen up here, um, Pacific Ocean Marketplace on Federal. Um, there's one up in Broomfield as well. Um, and all along Federal, there's some great markets, uh, little Vietnamese markets. Um, you can buy just some amazing products and some things you've never seen, some things you won't know what to do with, um, but worth checking out. Um, all over Denver. Great Mexican markets, um, you can buy just really fresh, great produce, um, things that you won't see, things like key limes, things like um, different peppers, different uh, spices, some fresh hoja santa, fresh episote, um, really, really fun ingredients depending on what type of cuisine you're cooking. Um, but get out there and try some different items, check out some different markets, um, they'll all have great produce items. You're seeing some of that crossover now in a lot of the more everyday markets. You're seeing little segments in King Supers and Safeways, and depending on what neighborhoods they're in, where you'll see more unique produce items, um, different produce items. Never a lot, but you'll see a little bit. Um, the Whole Foods of the world are definitely more adventurous with what they'll stock um, than some of the other grocery chains, just because they know they have a little more price point with the customer base, um, what they're going to sell, get a little more money out of you, can People are looking for different items, looking for more unique produce items, so easier to sell. Um, let's see. Any questions? What, what, um, what have you found with, if any, the proliferation of biodynamic farming? Do you guys deal with any? Biodynamic vendors? farming. <clears throat> You're speaking of where they have a sustainable cycle, where they have the, uh, uh, yeah, the tilapia with growing with the... Right. So just speaking of, there's a couple of farms in here. Um, they do some, but it's again, it's supply and demand. And usually places like that, um, similar to, they just don't provide enough, produce enough to be able to really make it uh, sustainable for a restaurant or a produce gotcha. company. Um, but they can do a dinner. I know a few of the places where they'd have a uh, tilapia, and then they'd get the greens that they were growing. Um, everyone's not familiar with the cycle. It's basically creating an entire cycle within itself. And so it's a sustainable setup to where they're, they're producing the fish. Um, the water from the fish tank comes up to hydrate the produce growing on the top. Um, and it's just a whole cycle of, um, I don't know how you describe it really aside from... It's kind of a closed ecosystem clo actually is what it is I think. Right. right so. And there's a lot of strange things that go on in that as well. But I just wondered if there, if from a produce standpoint, if you're finding farms are moving in the U.S. moving towards that, or is it still kind of a, you know, wacky thing out there? Or it's what, what fairly, do you find fairly niche. Fairly yeah. niche. It would take a lot of space, I think, is the biggest thing. It would take a huge undertaking, a huge building to be able to make it large enough to really make it profitable. Um, 
and you find that with, and that's the balance is, can you make money doing it? You know, you'd love to do it. Uh, Verde Farms, uh, microgreen company down south, attached to um, Fruition Farms. Uh, Chef Alex Seidel started his farm down there. They have goats. They do goat's milk, goat's cheeses, uh, microgreens. Um, but in the winter months, they can't pay the bills. They can't provide enough microgreens income to be able to keep the greenhouse running, to keep the lights on, to keep the heat going in the really cold months down or a little bit east of Larkspur. Um, so you get to that point to where it's what's, what makes sense, what can I still make mm -hmm. a buck on, like to be able to provide it all the time, but if I'm not selling enough microgreens to make it sustainable to where I'm making a profit, losing money on it, then where's the break-even point? Um, so you find that more and more is that you know, everyone wants to do what's right, everyone wants to do what's best, but at the end of the day, most chefs, most restaurants, you still have food costs to meet, you still have your bonus to worry about, you still have, you, know, you can't sell a plate of food for $45, or else no one would eat at your restaurant. So a lot of these things you have to take into consideration. It's everyone wants to do the right thing, everyone wants to buy the best ingredients, buy the organic ingredients, but what, at the end of the day, makes the most sense? on trying to have a, a balance between the two to where you can make it cost effective, make a profit, still feed the masses, um, and just have that fine balance. That's the quality, yeah. So we have uh, the uh, Blue Bear Farms. Anyone seen the Blue Bear Farm here over behind the um, convention center? So they have their own farm now. You've seen it. It's about you know, two acres of product for the hundreds of thousands of people that come through the convention center. That they feed with their little farm. Not reality, right? Anybody believes <laughs> that, but it's marketing. So they've marketed themselves that we have our own farm in Denver, right on Spear there. You know, they've got... 15 or 20 raised gardens that they can produce vegetables with. Um, great concept, great idea. You see uh, more and more neighborhood farms popping up, uh, little co-op farms where you can go and get your little plot, grow some vegetables, sell them to the local chef. Wonderful. But to think that out of that little plot and 15 raised beds or 20 raised beds, that they're going to be able to feed the hundreds of thousands of people that come through as tourists into the convention center every year is not realistic. But most people see that new story and they go, oh, it's wonderful. You know, they're feeding the masses out of this little raised bed. So perception is not always reality. Um, talked about farmer's markets. You know, of don't be duped into thinking that you know, they're giving you something that's not available yet. Um, don't be duped into thinking that you know, this item is from where it's really not. You know, and ask the questions. Because get more and more, there's a lot of restaurants because it is all the catchphrase now with local and sustainable and organic. And that. Are they really using organic? How would you know? Going into any restaurant, would you know if the product's organic? Would you know if the product's locally grown, sustainable, any of those things? You're just taking their word for it. You have no idea what's going on behind closed doors, what's going on in the kitchen. So don't always be fooled into thinking that what you're getting is truly what you're buying and what you're paying for. Um, it's not always the case. Nine times out of ten, you'd like to think that you know, they're doing the right thing, making the right choice. But again, when you're getting it's amazing salad, and it's got all these cool ingredients, and it's only you know, eight bucks, ten bucks. Chances are, it's it's not what they say it is. Um, but it's getting better. Uh, more and more great products coming to the forefront. Colorado-grown products. Um, we talked about the farm to the table. Um, that what's happening now is that instead of farmers growing items they think they might sell, they're coming to us. They're coming to farm or to chefs and saying. What do you want us to grow? What do you want us to use uh, throughout you know, your fall menu? What can we provide for you? Um, the Big Red F Group, which is Jax, Lola, Centro, and Boulder. Um, who else? That whole restaurant group. Uh, they go out and every year they contract with a farm um, on the front range here to uh, grow hard squash for them, winter squash for them. And they bring in three or four tons of hard squash to share throughout all their restaurants. So they tell them in advance. So there's no, so the farmers, you know, it's, it's easy money for him. He's growing something he knows he's going to have instant profit on every year, and it's, it's cut and dry for him. So he knows that he has already sold product. And so that's um, the Olathe corn crop is a great idea. Um, King Supers goes in every year and buys basically the entire Olathe corn crop, and they market it to everyone. They say, oh, Olathe corn is here. Colorado corn is here. You see all those Colorado proud items. Um, and they've really created that bond with the farmer to say, okay, we want to buy all of your products sell it exclusively um, across the front range. Well, this year it was a horrible year for Olathe corn. I don't know if anyone remembers eating Olathe corn last year. It wasn't that great. It wasn't sweet. 
Um, it was a bad year for corn because of the drought. Um, they had really hot, hot days and not cool nights, so the flavor wasn't great. There was better corn coming out of Pueblo. There was better corn coming out of Brighton in the front range. Um, so everybody was you know, hip to the lay the corn crop and thinking that it was, you know, and sold it and sold the name. Um, no different than Hatch Green Chilies. Um, does anybody know where Hatch Green Chilies come from? Okay. So most people just assume that it's, but really, it's an Anaheim pepper. It's an Anaheim chili pepper that comes from Hatch, New Mexico. Um, and because it has the namesake, so you see all these chili stands on the side of the road, um, some of them come from Hatch. A lot of them come from Pueblo. A lot of them come from the Front Range. A lot of them come from local farms. So it's not always from Hatch, New Mexico. Um, but it is a hot varietal Anaheim pepper. Fits the bill. Support the local chili stands. They do a great job. Um, but again, what did you pay for? What did you get? You know, you can't guarantee that it's from Hatch. It comes in a burlap sack. It's sitting in a pile of burlap sacks. You don't really know. Um, it's always better to investigate with produce. Check out what you're buying, what you're getting, where it's coming from. Make sure that what you're paying for is worthwhile. And, and get out there and shop. You know, don't always assume that just because it's at Whole Foods that it's better for you or different for you. You can buy equally great produce at 20 other stores in town. You're going to get as a much better deal on for better quality, um, more variety, more unique products. As, uh, as nutritionists and managers and owners of food operations, do you consult or have a department within Fresh Point that, you know, a chef comes to you or a nutritionist comes to you, we're designing a menu for this institution, we need some, some help in deciding, you know, applications of specific tomatoes and mm -hmm. nutritional value of, of specific squashes you know, our, our, I don't know, as, and I'm just kind of hypothetical here, but if, you know, I'm a nutritionist in a hospital and my, my particular ward or, or area, I don't know, needs a lot of potassium, do you consult with things like that? Does your company do that? We haven't. We haven't gotten to that point um, as of yet. Really more menu creation, menu design, seasonal items, um, finding alternatives when, when markets do go haywire, um, more of what we do. Nutritional aspect, really, our clientele, uh, we do deal with some hospitals, some um, retirement homes, that kind of thing, but really we leave it up to their staff to make those decisions. Um, we don't push any certain items on them or steer them in a certain direction um, because really they're the experts more than we are. I mean, we know what we have. We may make suggestions to where Seasonally, if something's more expensive due to market condition, and go, hey, you know, don't buy this right now. You're going to pay triple the amount for it. Why don't you move over to this item? Uh, it's coming out of Colorado, and it's a better deal right now. Um, it would save you a lot of money. So really try to stick more to seasonal items, um, ingredients that make more sense for people um, when there are market conditions, market issues, when we have freezes, when we have uh, so drought issues. Do you... Uh, um provide your customers with like a forecast of this is what we can expect over the next three months in the mm -hmm. produce arena. You really need to watch, you know, what your romaine looks like. It's going to be some problems or there's a bumper crop. Is, are there things like that that are generated through your... We do. We do. And again, that goes into where your, your grading scale on produce. Um, when there are crop conditions, um, usually the first thing to happen is that... Uh, the you know, market will go up, uh, supply and demand. Again, if uh, produce is scarce, the market goes up, prices get really expensive. Um, you go into a crop and then determine if it's a number one, number two crop, um, what you can get out of it, um, then what you're willing to pay for it. Um, we've walked away from, from crops and just said, you know, it's not worth it. Not worth the item, not worth bringing it in if we know we can't turn around and sell it, or the quality is just so bad, it's not something we want to sell to our customers. Um, it's most people tell you and they, everybody wants the best produce and so really when it's not a great product or not a great market um, we'll send out market reports market updates when there are heavy rains in area um, very muddy produce you'll see sometimes produce come in very dirty uh, very muddy if there's issues with that um, product that just uh, doesn't taste very well doesn't look great um, 
so many different issues. Um, and weather dictates a lot of that. You know, we constantly watch the weather. We're as much weathermen as we are produce people. Um, when there's heavy winds, you'll get what's called bloom drop on tomato plants, um, where every little blossom is potential for fruit. And so if the blossoms fall off, that's one less tomato that's going to be on that plant. So now your crop of five tons of tomatoes just turns into two and a half tons of tomatoes, or you hope is going to be two and a half tons of tomatoes. Then you have an infestation of an aphid that just took out another one ton of your tomatoes. So now your five tons of tomatoes is whittled down to one ton or one and a half tons of tomatoes. Um, so now all of a sudden you were hoping to get X amount per pound. You've had to renegotiate and come back to the market with whatever you think you can get for these tomatoes. They may look ugly. So really, market is everything. Market, forecast, um, weather is everything. Is that information readily available to managers of establishments? And it is. It is. We email that information out weekly. Oh, cool. Um, market reports that come out that will give you, mostly it's on base commodities. It's going to be on the real heavy moving items. Right. Um, things that are going to impact your food dollars the most. Um, when you're doing food costs, when you're doing food analysis, things that are really going to impact your bottom line the most, those are the things we're going to talk to you about. Um, when there is a freeze in Mexico, as there was a couple weeks ago, the price on romaine jumped through the roof. Case prices doubled. Uh, so people stayed away from romaine, or they bought a pre-washed and trimmed product, something where they didn't have as much loss. Case weights were down. Instead of a 40-pound case, it was only 25 pounds. So you're not getting as much yield out of a case. Um, so a lot of things that will impact uh, crop, just the food supply in general. And when we have market conditions, um, some people are understanding. Some people get a little frustrated with it. Um, it really depends. But there's not a lot we can do when it comes to weather. And we do have a freeze when you know, people complain about when their strawberries don't look good this time of year and kind of shrug your shoulders and throw your hands up and go, well, it is February. And, you know, strawberries are well, typically more a often. February crop. So there's always going to be um, some issue going on somewhere in produce. Um, never a dull moment. Never the same thing twice. Uh, always keeps us guessing with uh, what's going on in the world. So um, a lot of the market conditions you're going to see, you'll feel the impact in the grocery store. That's usually the first place you'll see it, in the retail market. Um, and it'll trickle down to food service. But again, they usually have a little more of the market share on what they can buy, and so you can get a better deal sometimes the market. A lot of times people will ask us, well, why can I get you know, strawberries cheaper than I can buy them from you? Um, there's a couple, Costco came along, Restaurant Depot, some other avenues where chefs can go and buy direct. We're cutting out the middleman and buying direct from supplier. Which in theory is if you have the time to do it, you can go do it. Cuts out you know, our delivery driver, our diesel fuel, our truck, everything else that it takes to get produce from point A to point B. Um, there are avenues out there, small restaurant tours to go and buy product on your own, um, whether it meat suppliers, fish, produce, dairy, um, buy direct rather than going through uh, a purveyor. Um, but services that we provide, again, just market information, things like that, um, food safety, um, a lot of things that you're not going to get from buying from a smaller purveyor, um, things that separate us from some of the smaller produce companies in town. Um, let's see. Any questions? Weird produce questions related? Well, cool. I think that's great. No questions? Matt, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.